Not on bolt strategy for property consultants. What is it and how can you use it to grow your business? That's what we're discussing in this video. Before we get into this strategy, I need to give you a quick disclaimer. This strategy isn't right for everyone. Some businesses won't be big enough to use it. And if you're not registered as a limited company, you'll need to do things slightly different, differently to get the end result. But this strategy is using mergers and acquisitions to grow your existing business. Now, the reason that you that you hear about this strategy so much in the corporate world is because if a large company have, say, a billion pounds in revenue, it's very difficult for them to grow by even 10% through organic growth. It just takes too long to tender and manage all of that extra work. How many tenders would they need to need to bid for them to win 100 million in new contracts? So the reason they use this strategy is because they can buy another business which might add 30% additional revenue to their business without having to do anything for it. And they do that because they have to satisfy shareholders and show that they're growing. But this, the same strategy can be used by smaller businesses. So let's look at the benefits of using this strategy and how you could use it in your own business. Let's look at the various options you've got when it comes to finding other companies uh, to buy or merge with. So the first thing you can do is look at buying or merging with a direct competitor. That's a business that provides the same service to the same group of people in the same location. If you can buy or merge with a direct competitor, it means you own more of the local market. When most people think about buying a business, this is generally as far as the search goes. But there are, there are lots of easier options that have a bigger impact on the business long term. The next, you could look at a property consultancy in a, in a new location. For example, you might want to have a presence somewhere else. So you could, you could look at a business in another region. Third, you could look for a property consultancy that serves another sector or another group of customers that you don't currently serve. Then you can look at what other products or services your existing customers might want to buy and look for companies that might be able to provide those, those offerings and buy or merge with them. The trick isn't to think about what you provide right now, but instead, what could you add to, to what you already do? And normally, what a lot of people do when they go down this route is to, to buy the business and then they'll replace all of the branding and put their own logos all over the acquired business. And actually, that's the worst thing to do for a small business. People generally do this for two reasons. First, they do it out of ego. They want everyone to see this big empire that they've built. And second, it's because they see much bigger companies do it and think that's just the way it should be done. The problem is, if you replace that business identity with your own, people will just think the, the other business has gone out, gone to the wall and they'll, they'll go somewhere else most likely to the competitor if you buy a business that provide that provides the same services there might be a reason that their clients chose to go to that business instead of yours maybe they've got some bias toward the other business so if you change the branding on that acquired business there's a chance that you might lose half of those customers the other issue is staff and suppliers. They already have buy-in and relationships with the, original with the original business brand. Staff and suppliers don't like change. It makes them nervous. And they can either leave the business or if, if they're a supplier, they might change how they work, such as reducing credit terms. The reason that big companies get away with it is because they're already well known by everyone in the market. They've spent millions on marketing and even when they buy a business, they still spend a huge amount on telling the world about that, that new acquisition. A, a, a better option, if you really want to satisfy your ego and show the world how big your empire is, you can create a brand that owns all of these businesses. The same could apply if you merge with another business, because in that case, you'll always have an argument over whose name you should use and what the name should be. But if you create a new brand, you can keep each business with their own brand name and then just say it's part of the ABC group. It solves any arguments. And I found a few examples of how larger businesses have done this themselves. 
because even though they're, they're quite large businesses, they still appreciate the risk replacing one brand with their own. If you keep the same brand and the names on the acquired business as, as well as your own brand and operate them separately, it means you own a bigger share of the market. Let me tell you about something I went through recently. A few years ago, I was looking for a plumber to service the gas boilers on some flats that we owned. The plumber we'd used before that, he, he'd just retired, so we needed to find someone new. So I went onto Google and I did a local search for a plumber. I've made these names up, by the way. So if, if you know someone with these names, then there's no connection to this story. Now, when I clicked on each of the search results, I noticed that they all had different websites. But a lot of them had the same phone number. And as it turned out, six out of the 10 were all owned by the same company. So if you think about that for your business, if there's 10 listings on Google, when your customers search, but you own six of those listings, you own 60% of the market. You've got a 60% chance of winning that client. But if you would rebranded those businesses, there'd only be five listings and you'd only own one of them. That's only a 20% chance of winning that client. So what are the benefits of using this strategy? Well, first you increase in size, which opens up larger opportunities and contracts. It might bring some key staff into the business that otherwise you might not have access to. And as a bigger business with more buying power, you can negotiate better terms from suppliers. The new business might have a, a product or service that you can sell to your clients and vice versa, which means both businesses end up growing. Buying a business is normally cheaper than trying to set something up from scratch. So, for example, if you wanted to stop, <coughs> if you wanted to stop pr providing a new service offering, that would have a cost to creating it and getting it up to that same level where it can operate by itself. There's also a lot of time involved in that. And if you're trying to target a new sector of clients, it can take a long time and cost a lot of money to win clients in that new sector. Having access to a new region means you can offer services to your clients in that region or attract new clients in that region, depending on, on the type of clients that you already work with. Another benefit can be a reduction in overhead or operating costs because you can share resources between the companies. If you both have offices in the same area, for example, then moving into the same building could reduce the office cost by 30 or 40 percent or more if both businesses have, uh, have extra capacity there. So buying a business, if you do it properly, can have a big impact on both businesses. Often you'll see both businesses double in size within a couple of years if you can get the synergies right. That means both reducing costs but also adding revenue by bringing the two businesses together. Now, I mentioned it's not right for everyone, and let me explain why. I've seen some business owners that buy a business and then it doesn't go anywhere. In fact, in some cases, their original business ends up going bankrupt. And that's because the business owner has moved all of their focus from the, their existing business and put it all into the new business. So the only time that a business should consider using this strategy is if they've got a dedicated management team for their existing business and it doesn't need the owner involved with it anymore. <coughs> Many people believe that if they buy a business, then it'll all be running smoothly and everything will be working perfectly. I can tell you it won't be. And the smaller the business is, the worse it will be. The seller will always paint it up to look perfect when in reality, there are all sorts of hidden issues that they aren't telling you about. So how do you do it? Let's look at the process now. The first thing I'd say is to get this right, you have to have at least one person in the business dedicated solely to making it happen. And after the deal's done, managing the whole integration of the two businesses, making sure every opportunity gets taken care of, such as having a, pros to, a plan to cross-sell to each other's clients and, and then look at how to reduce costs. After you've got that, then it's time to identify all potential businesses. 
part of identifying potential businesses is to to look at each business and see whether it's got a real synergy with yours if you if you put them together would it mean a two plus two equal in six or would it be doing a deal just for the sake of doing a deal in which case it would probably mean two plus two equals three but when we're talking about synergy what else is your client buying if you're acquiring or merging with a company to provide that cross sell to your clients and vice versa, you want both businesses to be in what we what we'd call the same product family. So what does that mean? The client has to see a clear connection between what you do now and the new product you're offering. So let me use an example. Let's say you're a plumbing company and you provide various types of plumbing services to your clients. Now, if you buy a business that provides financial advice, well, your clients aren't going to see the connection. They're going to think, what does a plumber know about financial advice? And likewise, the other firm's clients, they'll think, what does a financial advisor know about plumbing services? There's no natural connection between the two. So to make that connection, you have to stick to the same product family. So for that plumber, the product family would be the, the, the services within a building. So that, that could include gas services, electrical services, air conditioning and refrigeration. You can clearly see the connection between all of those services. Another example, if you provide temporary staff, well, the product family would be related to staffing services. So you could include HR, training, payroll and, and anything related to staff incentives or benefits. And that's, that's how you, you make that connection in your client's mind. You probably want to build a shortlist of between 400 and 600 companies that are suitable. And what you'll find is about 95% of them won't be interested in even having a conversation. The majority of people are what I, I call closed-minded. They aren't interested in anything except what's right in front of them. But to get started, you've got to initiate that conversation with them you'll probably find you might have four or five that are interested in a, in a deal out of that original shortlist. And from that, you might make a deal with, with one or two of them. Altogether, it'll probably be a 12 to 18 month process from start to signing the deal, unless you can get lucky along the way. So assuming you strike up a deal, let's look at the best way to structure it because this is one issue that comes up and can cause serious harm to a business if you don't do it right. Now, what, what normally happens is a business will buy another business and they'll transfer all of the staff and all their assets into one of, one of those two companies. Personally, I think the better way to do it, as we've already touched on, you keep each business independent. That means staff continue to be employed by the same company. That saves on all sorts of issues like Tupi, transferring employment, employment contracts over, as well as transferring clients over. <coughs> so you do this rather than your business directly owning the acquired business. Instead, you set up a holding company that owns both of these businesses. That way, they, they both continue to operate exactly as they did previously. The other benefit, if, if anything happens to one of these businesses, it doesn't affect the other. Whereas if you acquired a business and transferred a contract over to your business, but then found the contract was losing money, well, that would cause serious damage to your own business. Why would you want that risk when you don't need to? So you set up a holding company structure to protect both businesses. Now, there's, there's a word of caution with a strategy, especially when it comes to finding potential deals. And it's a trap most people fall into, which is to use a business broker. Now, on the face of it, you'd think a business broker would be the perfect place to find a suitable business to buy. But I've personally looked at over a thousand businesses listed for sale with over a hundred different brokers in the last 12 years. And they've all been a waste of time. The biggest reason is these business owners have been brainwashed by the broker to believe that a, that a deal has to be done in a set way. There's a set price, a set structure, and that's the only way to do it. And that's why it falls down. 
in most of the cases, the, the business is way overpriced. One example I've seen with a lot, seen a lot with these businesses, they'll have a ridiculous profit multiple with a price tag of something like 44 times profit. That means if the business made 100,000 in profit, they'd valued it at 4.4 million. Now, what does that mean in real life? Well, based on the profit that that business makes, it will take 44 years to pay for itself. And that's without any interest added. And no matter how much you try to show evidence of why it's not worth that, the brainwashing has already happened. The problem with business brokers, they get paid up front, normally based on a percentage of the valuation. But the valuation is what they've set. So it's, very un, uh, uh, it's a very unethical industry. All the issues I see all the time is that a, a broker will manipulate the account. So it looks like the business was more profitable than it, than it actually was. And they'll do that by pulling reven revenue from one year and pushing costs to the next. Again, it's all to increase that valuation figure so that they, they, they can get paid more. And the sad news is 98.7% of these businesses never sell, even though they've paid out hundreds of thousands in broker fees. So forget business brokers, they're a waste of time. Instead, just go direct to the businesses that you've shortlisted. And that's how you use a nut and bolt strategy to grow your property consultancy.